Welcome to Achieve Wealth through Value Add Real Estate Investing. This is the show where the guru hype is banned and you get direct insights from commercial real estate operators. If you're a passive investor, this show can help you better understand investment opportunities. And if you're an active investor, the lessons from each episode can help you to become more effective in your own deals. Now, here's your host, investor and author, James Kandasamy. Hi, this is James Kandasamy. Thank you for listening to this podcast. I appreciate you. I know I provide a lot of value through this podcast and I want you to share it with your friends, with your families and anybody else that you know that kind of benefit from listening to this kind of content. Go share it through Facebook, into LinkedIn, to Twitter, to Instagram or any other channels that you want to share it because sharing is caring. Thank you. Let's go on with the show. Sure. Sorry about that. Hey, audience and listeners, this is James Kandasamy from Achieve Wealth Through Value Real Estate Investing Podcast. Today, I have uh, Bill Manasaro from Southern California. And Bill has a very interesting uh, background. He's a founder and CEO of Manasaro Properties, uh, has a lot of uh, business and management experience. And um, he also uh, uh, founded Child Hope International, a 501c3 charitable organization that was featured uh, in CNN and being interviewed with Oprah Winfrey. Um, and also he's a host of the uh, top uh, rated all Old Dogs REI Network podcast, which has more than a million downloads in the past four years. Hey, Bill, welcome to the show. Hey, how are you doing, James? I'm doing very well, very well. So thanks for coming in on the show. And and uh, you know, I, I I I listen to your podcast as well. So uh, it's it's a lot of it uh, focused on uh, fifty five plus. Is that right? Uh, I, I know that's, that's a our, tagline there, right? Yeah, that's our our target. Um, you know, we the, really the needs for them are different than I think the majority of uh, investors, you know, especially millennials. It's very different. Okay. Uh, although we have a lot of younger people to listen, you know, our target is uh, trying to present things for people that are in a and, you know, maybe they're in a, uh, re- approaching retirement or they're in retirement and they're looking at real estate investing as a means to either grow their nest egg or, you know, produce more cash flow during retirement. Got it. Got it. Got it. So why not we talk about some of your real estate dealings? I think you are a GP in some like 900 plus units right now and you're doing some other asset class other than multifamily as well, right? Why don't we talk about that? Can you, can you give our audience a brief uh, overview of how do you engage in real estate nowadays? Sure. Yeah. Um, yeah. I started off um, I, I, kind of similar to your story, you know, buying single family and duplexes. Um, but I realized, you know, with my first duplex, uh, you know, I saw the economies of scale very quickly, you know, that I had, I, I paid about the same for my duplex as I did for my single family, yet I'm making twice as much. Mm-hmm. And uh, not only that, but, you know, I only have 50% vacancy when I have a vacancy. Um, I only have one roof to worry about. I only have one property tax payment, one insurance, but I got, it's like having two units, you know? And so I I saw that early on. I said, I've got to, I've I've got to, you know, start buying more units, you know, uh, properties with more units. And that's where I started moving into multifamily. Uh, I bought another, um, uh, some other properties and, uh, you know, that were smaller. And then I bought a 22 unit. That was my sort of my um, first jump into, a, a, a sizable, you know, commercial property. And then, and then from there, I realized, um, you know, I'd set this goal of, of uh, acquiring a thousand units by um, 2020. And uh, part of that goal was, I thought I would double the number of units I had each year. But, you know, you can do that for a while by yourself, but then there's a certain point where you're going to need help. And, and, and especially with such an aggressive goal, I think you could do it, by yourself, but it, it takes a little longer because you have to wait for the properties to appreciate, to be able to pull out the funds. And, you know, there's a, there's a lot of leveraging you have to do. So, but I wanted to, I, I really wanted to get in that hundred plus category pretty quickly. And uh, that's where I looked at syndication and, um, and then, uh, you know, came together as a GP with some, with some other uh, uh, investors and was able to jump up ahead of my goal pretty quickly that way. Um, and I think that's really the best, the best place to be for me. I, I, I really enjoy syndication. I think that there's a, uh, a lot you can do with that. Um, 
with the smaller properties. Well, you know, you had a, how many single family homes did you have at one time? I, I had like a 13. Yeah. Okay. So, you know, you know, the, the calls, the, a lot of work. <laughs> oh, oh yeah. You, you know, it's a, and, you're, and you're not getting paid a lot for that, you know? Yeah, it's, I know, I know. So, I, so I, you know, I saw the, the really the only way that made a lot of sense was a hundred plus units. And, and that's oh. really um, my focus now. Um, I did shift, um, you know, it's it, in that space, the apartment spaces, uh, you know, it was getting difficult to find good deals. People were, you know, not only paying asking, but people were paying above asking price in, on, on many of these bids. And I just, I couldn't even compete. You know, that was just crazy because I, I try to always buy below market. Um, and, and I was just not seeing the deals there. Uh, and then the opportunity came for something that I, I promised I would never do. I always promised I would never do ground up construction <laughs> and I would never do, uh, you know, um, a class and, and that, all of a sudden the opportunity came up for a ground up A class, but it was senior living, which really had an interest to me. And that was a assisted living and uh, memory care uh, in a facility of about 92 units. And um, so I, I, I partnered with a couple of other um, gentlemen that are, that are had, one that had been doing this for a long time. And uh, I have really enjoyed that. It, it, to me, it's a really good space to be in, especially when, the, you know, when, when it's difficult in the apartment uh, area to be able to find deals like, like I, you know, I used to be able to in, when I first started in 2015, 2016. So, um, so it's, been a, it's been a nice space to be in. Even through COVID, um, you know, this has done actually very good because the, uh, the gentleman who uh, has been, he's built uh, 22 of these as one of the partners. And uh, he actually got involved with uh, the operational side as well as just, you know, buying the property, building the property. Uh, and, and, that, and he did a very good job of putting together a team for each of these units that he built. And as a result, even during COVID, um, they didn't have a single out of 20 some odd properties, he didn't have a single case of COVID at all and in all of these homes um, and the average age of the the uh, people in the facility are around uh, 80 years old and uh, 80 85 and uh, so it was pretty amazing that uh, he had such a good record but he he really has a high standard and, and that really impressed me so um, I, when I got involved I, I said you know this is something I'm going to commit to for the long term so uh, so that's that's been the new space. Although I'm still looking at apartments all the time, <laughs> I can't find the great deals like you can. I don't know. You you know all the secrets here. I <laughs> I think I'm going to have to take your course or something. <laughs> well, the secret is hard work and persistence, <laughs> right? So, um, yeah, yeah. I mean, yeah, it's it's yeah, it is hard to find uh, a deal that makes sense, right? On on a day or you buy, right? I mean, most of the time, people just overpay and you know pray that it's going to keep on going up right so which is not the space that you know we, a lot of people who are sane want to play right so yeah. right. Well, that's why i like your approach too where you you know where you buy you you know as soon as you sign those those papers you know you have you already have equity you have yeah, a big chunk yeah. of equity there because right. you bought it under under value and you've you know you've of course, got that little buffer in there, you know, that you put yeah. cash in. But, mm. but, but I think that's the only way to go. That's the only, especially yeah. in today's economy. That, that yeah. Makes, yeah, I mean, when the economy crash and the house market uh, collapsed, people are going to say, "Oh, everybody should have bought right, right." But that didn't happen, or maybe it happened at two thousand eight, and everybody forgot about it. But buying right is always, always been the philosophy of real estate. Right? Yeah. Real estate is the only asset class where you don't have to buy at market value, like. Like stocks, you can't, you have to buy it at today's price, right? Whatever, every minute counts and that's the price you buy. Right. And, uh, but real estate is something that you can buy below market value. That's good. So let's come back to you. And, um, and uh, I mean, how did you run this b uh, big podcast with a million dollar, a million downloads for past... <laughs> I'm sure a million dollar I wish, I wish we <laughs> <laughs> uh, million downloads in the past four years, right? That's crazy. I mean, uh, how did you grow, grow that, uh, that uh, well, audience base? Well, it's funny because, you know, when I first started, you know, one of the things that I, I was, you know, I just started investing. I was living in Haiti at the time mm -hmm. and I was, uh, I was looking to come to the States and I, 
I was looking at real estate as a means to be able to supplement my own retirement and to build a legacy I could hand down to my children. Mm -hmm. and, and so I was, you know, I was very, very interested in it. And um, so I was, so I was, but I was starting later in life. I was, I was probably around 58 or so, you know, so, uh, you know, a lot, a lot of guys, like young guys like you, you know, start off and, uh, and you have lots of time to grow it, but you know, I, it's it, when you start later in life like that, there, you know, you can't really afford to make a lot of mistakes because, yeah, yeah, <laughs> you know, yeah. when you're younger, you can, you have know, a little higher risk and you can do things, you know, but, but, you know, we're, we've got this nest egg we've been working on, you know, building up all our lives and, mm. and you know, we just don't want to gamble with it. So, yeah, that's so, that, so that's really kind of, you know, the, what I was looking at. And so as, as I started investing, a lot of my friends, you know, they're in the same age, you know, age group, they're, you know, baby boomers, and they're asking me all about it. Well, how did it go? What did you buy? You know, how, how much did you get from, it? you know, and I was like emailing people all the time. And I just said, look, I'm just going to write a blog. And, and I want, you know, then you guys can read my story and I'll share, you know, what, what I'm doing. And I figured that would just you know, give me more time because I'm still trying to learn this real estate thing. Uh -huh. And, uh, in that process, it's a, you know, I started attracting a lot of people to my, you know, my blog, and I had a mentor at the time, who said to me, "You need to start a podcast." And I said, "Oh man, I don't want to, you know, start a podcast. <laughs> I, you know, I, I go, I got a, you know, I got a face for radio, but, <laughs> you know, I don't know if this is what I should be. You know, I, I stutter all the time. I say and um and all this." And so I, I thought, oh, this is going to be awkward. And he kept pushing me, kept pushing me. And I finally said, okay, I'll do one a week. Okay. And I'll see how it goes. And then if it doesn't go good, I'm not going to do it. And I started doing it and I loved it. And I absolutely really loved it. Mm -hmm. And, um, and I just, you know, I guess some of the things that were really fun for me was that I got to, you know, talk to these people that are leaders in the industry. I know, I know. And, you know, and normally they wouldn't take my call, but if I, but if I call them to have to be on the show, they would come. Right. Yeah. And so that, that's the advantage of podcasts, right? I mean, yeah, we do share to everyone, but as a podcast host, you're able to talk to someone, you know, uh, that you don't simply get the time for. Right. So exactly. <laughs> and I, so, I, so I was talking to these guys, but there was also connecting and making friends with a lot of these people too. And, and it's, so uh, this is really good. So I added another day. So I said, I'm going to do, I'm going to Mondays, I'll do interviews uh, on Fridays. I'll, I'll just talk, you know, and I'll talk about stuff like, okay, how, uh, you know, how to assess cap rate or how to, you know, uh, calculate out ROI or whatever, you know, I have these special topics or whatever on Fridays, but on Mondays I have my interviews. But then I started to find out something else as I started to, as I started to grow, I made connections, people that I could partner with, people I could work with. A lot of, lot of great advantages came from that. But, but the thing I like the best about it is see, I say, I do my own show notes. Here it is. I've been doing this thing for four really? years. I do my own show notes because for me, it's class. Okay. <laughs> I, I, I'm in school. Okay. For, for, that, for that 45 minute interview, I'm in school, but I can ask the teacher anything I want. You know, and so I, I, when I go into an interview, I am in there trying to learn, you know, yeah. trying to pick up stuff. So, so for me during the interview, it's kind of, you know, you're thinking about the next question and, and you, you always are going through it. But when I went back to the show notes, I could really listen and I could decipher and I could dig in and I, and I'm, it's like, I'm reading a book every week, you know, because some of these guests are just have great, I mean, that you're, your first interview with you, I was just amazed at what you had done. <laughs> and uh, no, and those, those are things that I, I learned, I take to heart. And I, I so started to grow. And as I st started to, you know, get bigger, okay, you know, more and more people started to listen. I, I, I got asked on other podcasts, and I started to get, you know, out to different audiences. But uh, when I moved into syndication, and uh, my you know, my listeners started to hear about it, then they also took an interest in investing in the projects that I was doing too. So I didn't even think about that, you know, but it actually ended up being a, another, another benefit of this podcast. So, so over time, you know, it just kind of grew on its own, you know, again, you got to think of this baby boomer audience every, every day, there's 10,000 people that turn 65 in, in the U.S., Okay, that's that baby boomer bubble, and it just keeps moving and moving. So there's a lot of people in that space that really have a have a lot of needs, and a, a lot of it pertains to you know 
maintaining a good return on their nest egg, you know, if they have money already set aside in a 401k or whatever it may be, or they're realizing, hey, you know, this, I'm not living the, the retirement of my dreams, you know, <laughs> we're going to need another couple of thousand dollars in our, you know, monthly income. And, and so they're going to learn how to, you know, how to do that through listening to the show. So, so, but you did find that niche of audience that you really want to cover, right? That's good. That's really good. So in terms of the people who are senior, right? Like, I think, I, I think you define it as more than 55 plus, right? So yeah, by the way, I just want to remind you, age is a relative thing, right? So <laughs> when you are 80, when you look at someone 60, you say that person is so young, right? So, <laughs> <laughs> it's the truth. That's why you just look like a kid to me, Jim. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, when you say I'm young, I'm thinking, oh my God, is that true? <laughs> <laughs> I'm feeling so young. <laughs> yeah. So what do you see? What do they look for like in a in a commercial you know investment like multifamily or senior living? What does this senior people look for, right? Or, or what do they appreciate more? Yeah, there, there's there's kind of different different groups. You know, there, there are there are some people that um, you know, they're retired but they've got a lot of time on their hands and they really don't, you know, it's like me, I can't think of ever being retired because I, I, you know, what am I gonna do, sit around and watch, you know, soap operas? <laughs> yeah, or, you what know? are you gonna do? <laughs> no, I know, I just, I like working, I love, and I love yeah. learning stuff and, you know, and that's why I was so excited about real estate because it was brand new for me and I, 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 mm. I love the learning process. And so a lot of these guys wanna get active. They wanna be active investors. Mm. So those guys, you know, they're gonna start buying, you know, uh, duplexes and start growing and, and build up a, a you know a portfolio that they're going to they're going to maintain throughout their retirement and they'll mm-hmm. hand it off to their kids you know when they pass away and um so that's that's their focus others they, they you know they're they've worked they've they're, they're want another job <laughs> you know so they're looking at uh, good returns so they they may get involved in a um in their own you know properties some of them will do both they'll get their own properties and they'll and they'll invest in syndications uh they may get involved with REITs or crowdfunding or something like that uh, but they're they'll do mostly passive investing uh-huh. and so those those folks are they're looking for good good returns they know what the what they can get in the stock market they know and when they see a lot of syndication they say hey that's that's much better than I'm getting in the stock market. Even though the market has been good, you know, uh, I think a lot of people are finding that syndication, it's good because it's backed by something tangible. Whereas stocks, you know, I, I was in technology for years and, and in technology, you know, I, where these companies could come and go and disappear in a, you know, in a heartbeat. And, and I was, in fact, I worked for an internet company that, uh, you know, it was right in the middle of the bubble. It just popped and, and all of a sudden, all these stock options that were worth millions were worth nothing. You know, I couldn't even use it for wallpaper. You know, <laughs> it was absolutely worthless. And so I, I think people like the idea of having something tangible. You know, there's land. They can go and look at that investment that they participated in, walk around it, you know, kick the walls, and, and it's yeah. real, you know. And yeah. I think that's where the, where the real estate syndication is such a, such a strong uh, thing with, with the baby boomer generation. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, interesting when you talk about stock, you can lose all the money. I mean, I had a last week when uh, when we were talking, I was talking to an investor and and I, I sent that person my PPM and in the first thing, I mean, PPM is usually a bit scary language, right? Because they want to make yes. sure everybody's aware. And this person, first time investing in commercial real estate, they, you know, the person called me and they say, this PPM say I can lose all my money. I say, yeah, of course you can lose all your money. This yeah. is an investment, right? And he said, no, no, in stock, you don't lose money. No, of course you can lose money. Stock is worse, right? (laughs) At least uh, real estate, you have that brick and mortar building standing there, right? So exactly. (laughs) So, but I think people don't understand that stock. You can definitely lose money, right? I mean, it's all in the fine prints, right? They just make the font so small, so you don't really read it, right? And and there's so many people making money out of the stock market. There's so much middleman people making money out of the fees. Uh, You know, we just do not know, right? So. That's just, just uh, something that came to my mind as you talk about, you know, stock, you can lose money, you know, but sometimes people forget that stock, you can lose money, even though we have been having a really good run in the past, what, uh, I don't know, what, five, 10 years, I guess, right? So right. that's good. So basically, so what I'm thinking is like, what you're saying is in terms of 
the senior people like you know 55 plus and 65 70 you know they want to look for more cash flow low risk i think because they want to make sure that their retirement money is well kept and uh, you know are taken care of because they need it for retirement right so you want to really make sure that uh, you choose that kind of investment rather than you know you know huge very high risk deals and all that i mean you can get a lot of equity multiple too as long mm-hmm. as you're able to split your retirement account into two and you know that you can you can uh, balance between that two. That'll be that'll be a really good thing, right? So, um, good. So, I mean, do you have this kind of discussion with your with your investors all, uh, all the time? And what kind of concerns do they see in, in like uh, in commercial real estate? Is there anything that they think that oh, can I can I be aware of this more? Um, yeah, it's you know it is. I have the same things with you when you have new investors. Mm-hmm. Um, I spend, you know, email after email, you know, answering, you know, a lot more questions. And, and that's, that's why sometimes um, some of these, uh, the PPMs, you know, are for, you know, sophisticated investors, you know, primarily. And mm-hmm. because it, when they're more experienced, then they, they understand the risk. They understand, in fact, a lot of the questions are easier to answer because they understand the, um, you know, wh- what a preferred return is and things. And, and they, they, they just, uh, you know, there aren't as many questions and it, and it gets difficult if you've got a lot of investors, you know, that are first timers, you know, to be able to field all those, those questions. But, but after they get experience, after they start to see it, they, they get more sophisticated. Like one of the things that uh, with ground up construction, which was, you know, again, uh, new for me, was that uh, it's, it's a little different model with a value add deal. You buy it. Okay. Um, you know, they can, they can start getting their, their dividends, you know, in a fairly sh- quick period of time. Uh-huh. But we have, you know, one year at least of construction time where there's, there aren't going to be paid any dividends. They're not going to be paid any, in, any payments until, um, until we get people in the, in the, the facility. But, but what we do is, um, again, the, 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 ge- the gentleman who has built all of these, uh, that's a part of our partners here, he has uh, learned that he can. He has it down to like twelve to fourteen months max. He knows how to, how to get that whole job done. And you know, and we're talking seven acres of property. It's a single story oh. facility for the senior living, and uh, so uh, people aren't used to, you know, that waiting waiting that period of time necessarily uh, before they start getting um, funds. Uh, and then once they do, it's uh, it's different because we uh, when we build, okay, we we already have the the land, we bought the land, and uh, then the next thing is a construction loan, and so we literally only have that construction loan for the the three years or five years that we might hold on to that property, uh, as opposed to you know getting into a- agency debt and you know Fannie Freddie uh, funding for, like you would for an apartment. Um, this is a construction loan. So, you know, everything's based on that. We're looked at, we're looking at, uh, you know, again, the 75% of that uh, uh, would be covered by the loan. And then we have to raise the other 25%. Um, and, um, and, and in that process, it's, uh, you know, it's, it's a little bit different. And, and they're, uh, I don't know, construction loans are pretty easy to get right now, as opposed to, uh, as I, I know that, Fannie and Freddie are, I mean, they're, they're still giving out funds, but they're, uh, they made it a little more difficult. You, you know, you're, the I mean, reserve, they, right? So they have reserve yeah, requirements. The reserves, liquidity and so forth have, have to be um, there. And it, you know, it makes it a little bit tougher for some people. So, uh, so this, this makes, you know, it's a different format for somebody that's used to doing um, apartments, but the returns are, are very good. And they're, you know, they're, um, I, I don't even know if I can mention what the returns are on the year because you know we it's a 5016 uh, 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 506B. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, so I can't really mention the a lot of details, but but the you know it it does it, it, it you know it, it does have very good returns, and I think that's what people like because uh, what what what's attractive in the senior living is also that. Um, after a very short period of time, the REITs love these uh, these properties, uh, healthcare uh, REITs, and there are uh, REITs that uh, 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 other real estate REITs that love it because of the you know the the quick turnaround on it because we oh. we we usually have it fifty percent rented before it's even open, and uh, in terms of uh, you know occupancy, and then after it opens up, we we fill it pretty quickly from that point on, and. Uh, so the, the the 
because of the demand in this area that the, it's going to be growing, it's going to be over the next 10, 20 years, it's just going to peak up to a, a, just a phenomenal number of, of facilities required to house seniors. And I think that's also a concern with some of the people that listen to the show is that they're thinking, yeah, I may have funds now for my retirement, but what about, you know, if I need assisted living, um, you know, do I expect my, my family to, my kids to, you know, you know, take me into their home or move into my home or, uh, you know, what, what, what are my plans for that? And there's, there's insurance people can get for assisted living, but it's very expensive. And oh. so a lot of people are looking at, you know, maybe, you know, maybe even investing in my own facility, you know, so that I could, I could move in there at one point um, oh. and, uh, or be able to have the funds to cover it because, uh, you know, it's it's expensive, you know, for a full care facility, and uh, people need to uh, you know, need to plan ahead for that kind of thing. Got it, got it, got it. Let's talk about your five hundred one C foundation. I mean, um, when did you get involved with that? Uh, why you why you did that? Why, why I mean, what, what's the sure. objectives and background behind that? Sure. Well, I was, uh, you know, it was funny because I'd spent all these years in business. I told you I was, you know, on, on technology and uh, corporate side, entrepreneurial side, you know, I was um, very busy. And uh, there was a, a point in my life where I felt called, you know, by God into, uh, into, into serving called five, uh, called Child Hope International, you know, to help oh. children. And, um, we started off as, as a ministry where we worked, uh, we had a music ministry, we traveled all around the world, um, you know, had CDs and our own music and everything. It was a really neat uh, thing. And my, my kids kind of grew up in that environment where we were always, you know, going places, going, doing concerts and doing things like that. And, uh, and while we were on the, uh, um, you know, doing uh, one of these concerts, we, we um, uh, partnered with uh, uh, World Vision, I uh, know it's Compassion International, and uh, we would, do, you know, do things where um, my my kids would actually work in their booth, and they'd get sponsor kids that that were in need in different parts of the world. And my daughter, I have, uh, well, I have seven kids, but one of one of my kids, uh, Ariana, she was um, working in this booth, and she said, "Dad, you know, can I sponsor one of these kids?" And I said, "Sure, but you know, you you got to you got to you you know." support the kid on your own, you know, and, and, uh, you know, with your allowance or whatever. And she said, no, I'll do it. I'll do it. And she ends up picking this little kid from Haiti. And, uh, and she just got so into this kid. She was so excited and she'd write to him all the time. And she started studying about Haiti and what the, what, you know, the poverty that was there and all this. And, and, uh, over time she, she just got this heart for Haiti. And one day she told me, Dad, I, I want to build an orphanage, a school, a church, uh, a, uh, you know, all these things in Haiti. And I said, seriously, <laughs> you know, she's like nine years old. So I'm kind of going, OK, you know, next week she'll want to be president, you know, <laughs> but but she still she still had this interest. And so we had an opportunity with our music ministry to actually go to Haiti and do a, a concert tour. And we went around to schools and churches and different places. And um, she when she when we arrived in Haiti, you know, there was the, at a time they didn't really have a tarmac, and you just got off of the the plane, you walked off, you know, down the stairs onto the runway, oh. and I remember going down there. My my daughter got to the end of the runway, and she just got on her knees and kissed the ground. She goes, "Daddy, I'm home," and I go, "Oh my gosh," you know, and I was just like really touched by this, and and she just she. Just you know, she she knew when she we were there. We went around and saw a lot of orphans, a lot of kids living on the streets. I mean, as young as three and four years old, wow. living on the streets. Uh, it just it just tore her heart out, and uh, and it, you know, it was a, a very powerful trip. And then we, as we're flying home, I'm sitting next to my wife, and she goes, you know, honey, I think we're going the wrong way on this plane. You know, I go, no, I, I'm not sure. I'm not hearing that because <laughs> you know? I, you know, I I, I didn't think you know, gosh, you know, moving to Haiti and doing all this stuff. Um, well, sure enough, over time, my whole family, they all wanted to move to Haiti. Mm. And I was kind of the last one to come along. <laughs> and I said, okay, let's do it. We sold everything. We, we hopped on a plane and we took, we already had our nonprofit organization. And so we went over there and we, uh, we just started, you know, finding these kids on the street, living on the streets. And we uh, opened up a boy's home, a girl's home. 
Uh, then we uh, opened up a school, a medical clinic. Um, we uh, started uh, we we started all kinds of outreach. We we came up with this what we call a vocational program where we opened up a series of different businesses, mm -hmm. and each each business was uh, an actual business that operated. We had a silk screening, a bakery, a sewing, all these different types of businesses, and the kids as they're uh, they don't have foster care there. So what they have are what they call orphaninas, which are orphanages. And the kids grow up there until they're 18 and then they're on their own. But we would see a lot of these orphanages in Haiti and the kids would leave and they, they were just back on the street again because oh. they didn't have any training or anything. So, so we went over and beyond with our orphanage and we started training these kids uh, in multiple languages. Um, they already spoke uh, Creole, which is the, the, nat the, the spoken language there, but French is the official language. So they learned French in school. We taught them English. And then we also taught them uh, Spanish too. So most of these kids knew at least four languages by the mm -hmm. time they graduated. Plus we, we put them all the way through school, the French school system there. Uh, but we also taught them how to run a business so that they could work within our business. And if they um, could master it, what they would do is go back to their villages that they were from. They would open one of these businesses and we would help support them, you know, through our, you know, our, our, our sort of base business, our incubator. And uh, that would help them to be able to, you know, survive themselves. Because there was, at that time, there was 80% unemployment in Haiti. <laughs> we thought we have it bad here in the States. I mean, 80% unemployment is terrible. Yeah. And so we, uh, we helped these kids to learn trades. Uh, some of them, you know, went on to college. And, uh, you know, there's kids that are in school right now, you know, to be doctors and lawyers and, and uh, but there's also kids that are, most of them are, you know, have at least one trade. So even while they go to school, you know, they can have their little business that keeps them, you know, fed and so forth. And so that's, that's really what we did for 12 years. We lived in Haiti. Uh, it grew to quite a big thing, um, our orphanage. And, and, you know, I, when I, when I was looking at doing something, you know, when we were looking at moving back to the States, I was looking for a business or something that I could start because I'd started businesses before. And that's when I started looking at real estate. And I thought, gee, you know, this can be a great way to, you know, support us and, and maybe hand, hand down a legacy to our kids. But we can also use those funds to support our activities in Haiti, because that's still going on today, even though we've moved uh, back from Haiti, we're we're very active and, and the kids are still there and we're still doing, you know, the, the work that we were doing before. So it's, it's very exciting to be able to look at real estate as a means to be able to support those activities too. And that's, and that's, I believe, you know, as we become successful in real estate, you know, I understand that you're forming, you know, a, a five. Yeah. Yeah. We are doing a 501 C too. Yes. Oh, it's so great. And I think that's, you know, that's what we do is we give back, right? When, yeah, when yeah. we, we, when we're blessed, we bless others. And that's, mm. that's really where we we're at with it is we're continuing to do that. Got it. Got it. Yeah. We, we sponsor uh, uh, kids right now. Uh, often it's just for mainly for education in India, um, Africa and Mexico. These are the three That's big awesome. uh, states. That's yeah. so great, James. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> so we want to formalize that uh, effort and make it much more bigger. So we need the 501c3 because it's a lot more structured. It allows uh, other corporates and organizations to also contribute, right? So because we have, right. we have, we have big plans and you know, we want to be able to attract as many um, people who want to you know, be in the cause as well, right? So it's all very... Really, open and as long as we can give back now that's that's the ultimate thing right why we why we come to the earth i guess right so yeah, right, yeah, we, right. yeah. we achieve something in life yeah of course but we also give back to others as well so yeah right so absolutely so how how did you got uh interviewed with on, on with oprah how was that experience well, it was uh, it was pretty intense. We um, what happened? I don't know if you remember the earthquake that was in Haiti and uh, yeah, yeah, Haiti. correct. That's a big earthquake. Yeah, earthquake. oh, it was, it was horrible. Hundreds of thousands of people died. We were there when that happened. Oh, and, really? Yeah. And so we had our uh, we had a boys' home and a girls' home, and uh, some of these other things I told you about. And um, when we also had a medical clinic too. 
but when the earthquake happened, it just, it was frightening. You know, we, we were totally blessed. I, I believe the hand of God was on us because none of our kids were, were killed and, and are, are harmed. Um, and and uh, even the staff, uh, we had a staff of about 75 people at the time and nobody was, none, none of their families were harmed, but uh, there are still hundreds of thousands of others that died. And in our neighborhood, you know, you would see our, the, uh, these different buildings, like our orphanage would be here and then right next door, a building would be completely collapsed. And then there'd be another building and then another one collapsed. It was just real random, you know. Mm -hmm. And uh, so when the earthquake happened, um, it just, it, it was just an instantaneous thing. All of our kids were scared to death. They came out of the, their house. We have a, our own little soccer field there that the kids play on. And they all just want, they didn't want to go inside of a building because it was so scary yeah. an experience. And so we, we brought them all out to the soccer field. We got all their mattresses out there. And I said, you don't have to go in the building. You can be okay here. And we had two nurses there working in our clinic at the time. And so we started setting up, you know, there just in case, uh, you know, we're checking all the kids to make sure they're all okay and nobody was harmed. But then all of a sudden people from all over the neighborhood just started coming. Just, it, it just... It was this just walking, limping in, some people missing limbs, some people with their heads cracked open. I mean, just, uh, it, was, it was horrible. So our nurses, you know, we just, we took them in. We said, okay, we're, we had these, uh, we have a feeding program there. We had all these tables. So we started putting all these tables out, putting a sheet on them and making them into beds. And we started taking these people in and caring for them during the earthquake. And while that was happening, um, you know, it was just, it was just one, one thing after it was just growing. The word was getting around that we had people, you know, that we that had people that, cause all the hospitals had collapsed. People couldn't go to the hospitals. There was no, nowhere to go. And we just had this little, you know, neighborhood clinic that, you know, we didn't have all the supplies to do the things we had to do, but we, it was just a, a series of miracles one after another that allowed us to get through. Um, it, we, we had these, this uh, triage centers, what happened. And all of a sudden, you know, we're, 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 our nurses are just overwhelmed. You know, they, they couldn't deal with people missing limbs and things like this. And uh, we had a, a guy that came and knocked on our door one day and, and we're just praying, you know, constantly the whole time. We're kind of going, oh man, you know, we got to get through this. And, and we're praying and, this, and, this, and this, there's a knock on the door. A guy comes and he's there with his wife. He goes, look, our house collapsed down the street. And he said, you know, do you, I hear you guys need help. Do you need us to help? And I go, well, what, what, what do you do? Yeah, we can, we can use help. And he goes, I'm an orthopedic surgeon. <laughs> I go, whoa. And his wife was a nurse. And I'm going, oh, my goodness. I go, boy, we can put you to work. And this guy, for three days, I don't think he ever slept. I mean, we, we had to do amputations in our kitchen, in the boys' home kitchen. And, I mean, there was just, it was a traumatic thing. But while this was happening, we got a lot of a lot of um, uh, a lot of press that came, and CNN was just you know following us around, and 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 uh, you know we were on uh, on a regular basis just updating people on what's going on there. Um, we had uh, Sky News and uh, you know just all of all kinds of uh, stuff going on, and it, it just attracted a lot of people to what we were doing there. And out of it, uh, there was one lady that was uh, named Soledad O'Brien, who was with CNN, who was covering the event. She uh, uh, she said, you know, we want to do a, a special, you know, um, you know, documentary on what you guys do here. And so she, uh, after the earthquake, she came back and and she just came back to visit just to check on us and you know and stuff and see how we were doing. She brought her daughter to to see what we were doing and to meet some of the the kids in our, our orphanage and and. Uh, and then we ended up, uh, you know, doing this documentary together and uh, that got out and, and it was released. Um, and I think you could do a search and find it. It's called Rescued. Um, and then shortly after that, um, uh, Oprah Winfrey contacted us and uh, wanted to come and uh, interview my daughter who had the dream, you know, about this orphanage and, and uh, to meet the kids and so forth. And so she came and she did a special. She also... Um, was there to, uh, and saw Sean Penn, you know, who also had a, 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 a big uh, effort going as well during the earthquake. And so, um, so it was, uh, yeah, it, it, uh, so did, it, so did Oprah come to Haiti and meet you? Yeah, guys, she, she oh. came there and she, okay. she, uh, uh, they were there for about a week and, uh, and okay. filmed, uh, you know, filmed this, uh, it was, I guess it was about a 30 or 40 minute, uh, um, uh, piece on it. Yeah. 
Got it. Got it. Very interesting. Yeah. It's one thing to watch it on TV. I mean, I, I remember it very clearly. Watching it TV is just a news. You know, you're not involved. You know, so far away, you can't do anything, right? But another thing, listening from you who have been there, because now I can feel so much of uh, happening there, right? What happened? Because you went through it. And it's like one degree separation, right? I know you who have went through it rather than, you know, there's no, there's no degree of separation when you watch it on a TV. It's just, it's just another news, right? So it's, it's different, <laughs> right? And I'm sure you feel it more, more absolutely, right? Because you were there you know, on, on the ground, right? So that's, that's uh, awesome that you came and, uh, I mean, you went and uh, you have spent a lot of your effort and your time and, to help out, right? So yeah, we ended up uh, after that. Um, again, you know, we got a lot of attention as as a result of it. Uh, there are a lot of funds came in, so we ended up building three hundred houses for oh. people that were there. Oh, and, that's good. Yeah, so that that was like a, and it's not like construction here. You know, everything's block. You know, it's all block and cement. You know, mm. um, and they're usually you know one one room or two room place at the largest. Um, we even had some that we made out of plywood that were just you know, they, they just needed a house. And so there were some some enterprising people in, in the area that were just, you come up with these little prefab houses that we were able to build for people. So, so yeah, it was a, it was a process and we continued on helping people with the, you know, housing, uh, helping a lot of the people that were harmed, some that were orphaned, some of the kids that were orphaned ended up coming into our, um, into our orphanage and stuff. So, uh, yeah, it continued for years past that, uh, that we were very involved. Got it, got it. So from the time when your daughter said, said she's going to, you know, uh, take care of this, uh, you know, a kid from Haiti to now, after all that experience, did your life perspective change? Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Big time, big time. I mean, it's, it's really interesting because she was nine years old when she had this dream, you know. And we came to Haiti when she was 12. Okay, she's uh, she's 20, uh, 28 now, and uh, she she uh, she just ha had a heart for those people. She was she was always in the street, and she was always finding babies and finding. You know, she just she would just she was. And you know, all my kids are are fluent in Creole, uh, Haitian Creole, and they can, you know, they they know their way around and they're really comfortable. Um, uh, even when there were there were a lot of kidnappings in Haiti at one point, um, and there was an attempted kidnapping for my my wife and daughter, um, and we had other scary you know things that happened there. But uh, um, even there, the the people in the neighborhood were so wonderful. They just said, you know, nobody's going to dare to kidnap you because you know we've got your back basically. And uh, and they were just uh, wonderful. The people just. Uh, you know, we're always watching out for my family. I always felt safe for my kids, you know, roaming around and, and doing things uh, to help the people there. So it was, a, it was an amazing experience. I can't compare it to really anything in my life. It was uh, the, probably the, the, the greatest experience outside of, you know, my, my, my marriage and, and the birth of my children, you know, that I experienced here. Uh, it's just uh, absolutely amazing. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, that's awesome. That's awesome. So, Bill, why don't you tell our audience how to get hold of you and sure. your website or any other contact information? Yeah, I, th I think the the best place is our website. It's uh, called the uh, Old Dogs REI Network. Okay, so uh, dogs is spelled D A W G S. You know, and uh, so it's Old Dogs REI for Real Estate Investing um, Network dot com. And, uh, and uh, if you go there, there's the blog there. You'll also, uh, the podcast is there. Um, and there's, we have a lot of resources. Um, you know, we don't do coaching or anything like that, but we, we have a lot of, um, you know, references. We, we refer people out and we do have a lot of resources there um, that people can use, uh, you know, in 450 podcasts that they can listen to to learn, um, you know, learn how to do real estate investing. So. Yeah, yeah. The hardest part in in Bill's podcast is uh, he asks all the guests to howl at the end. <laughs> that's right. <laughs> Your listeners have to just come and listen to you howl because yeah. that's uh, that, that. Yeah, look up James. Uh, oh my people. God, my howling is really <laughs> bad. But but I just remembered something. Have you ever howled yourself in in any podcast in your own podcast? Yeah, I did. I, okay. I, uh, okay. Otherwise, I would have asked you to do right now. <laughs> she got out of that. <laughs> <laughs> all right. So, all right. So, 
Awesome, Bill. Thanks for coming into the show. I mean, uh, I think you added a lot of value in terms of perspective, what you're doing, you know, different thoughts process of all the, you know, how seniors invest and, you know, different aspects of uh, different asset class and all that. So thank you for coming and that's it. Thank you. Uh, great. Thank you, James. It was great seeing you again. That's it for this episode. If you'd like to learn even more, check out James's free audiobook. It's the audio version of his best selling book on passive investing. You can get the audiobook completely free, along with other valuable resources, by visiting www.achieveinvestmentgroup.com forward slash free audiobook. Also, be sure to join our Facebook group too. To find it, just do a Facebook search for Multifamily Investors Group. Thanks for listening. Join us again for another episode next week. See you then.